let's move on. I like this one a lot because this is different from what we have been doing so far when it came to visualization. We are not going to do back propagation or anything. And you're going to see why. This is beautiful. Trying to visualize what your neural networks are trying to do. This is a very recent paper. It's in 2020. And the idea is network dissection. So far, what we have been trying to do was asking our neural network, where are you looking at while giving me this prediction? What pixels did you focus on? With network dissection, you are asking different questions from your neural network. You are asking, what are you looking for? And why are you looking for that? So these are tougher questions, and you're going to see why. Throughout this slide, a unit is going to correspond to a slice of your feature map at a particular layer. So you're going to have feature maps at a particular layer, which is a tensor, across a channel. You're going to have a slice, which is going to give you a single feature map. That one is going to correspond to a unit. And that's what we mean by a unit here. Or you can think of this as the activations of a single filter. So you're picking out one of the channels at one of your layers, intermediate layers, and trying to understand that. It turns out that some of these units are going to correspond to object detectors. They're going to detect objects. Let's take a VGG16 network. Rather than training it on ImageNet, let's train it on Places365. That's a data set of 365 scene categories. So that's a new data set for you to explore. This has 365 classes at the end. We just train it, and we know that a VGG16 is going to have 13 convolutional layers. And we're going to try to study every single uh, unit per every single convolutional layer. We're going to pick out every individual one of them and try to study it. How can you study it? You have some activation which is being computed by this particular unit. And we know that the deeper you go into your convolution, especially VGG16, you are reducing the resolution. And then you are picking out a slice of that tensor that is coming out. This is a single feature map, one of your um, channels. It's going to depend on the image that went in. You take an image, you push it through your neural network, and it stops at a particular layer. And that's going to give you the unit. And then you pick out a particular unit in that particular layer. So it's going to depend on X. It's going to depend on U. But then this is going to have a low resolution. It's going to have a lower resolution compared to your original image. You're going to do interpolation for every single pixel in your image. You're going to up-resolve it. X is your test image. P is the image position, pixel 1, 1, pixel 1, 2, pixel 1, 3, et cetera. And then you're just up-resolving this unit to have the same resolution as your input image, OK? So far, so good. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to try to look at the top 1% quantile. And this is where this 1% is coming in. You're going to count the number of pixels that are going to be above a threshold. That's going to be the event that you're defining. And then you're going to compute the probability, which is exactly the counting. You're going to count the number of times that this condition is true. And then you're counting not only over your positions in a single image, but over your entire data set. We know that if you set t to be a small number, then you're definitely going to end up being bigger than 1%. That's for sure. It's going to happen. But we want to make the life a little bit harder. So you're going to try to maximize your threshold. And this is going to give you the maximum threshold that's going to end up being above 1%. So 1% of your pixels in your images are going to end up being above this threshold. Now that you have this TU, you can start visualizing. That's the only tool that you need it. How are you going to do it? You're going to pick out the pixels that are going to end up being above this threshold for a particular image. So here, this is only one image above to compute TU. You are doing it over all of your images. You pick an image, you pick a particular unit, and then you pick out the corresponding pixels that are going to end up being above this threshold. And let's visualize. This is VGG16. An input image is going to go in, a bunch of convolutions, a bunch of pooling layers. You can pick one of your layers 
a slice of that layer is going to give you a unit. And then you can look at the pixels of that unit that are going to be, end up being above this threshold. And you can see that it is focusing on this portion of your image. So it is sort of that unit, unit 10 of this convolution is picking out perhaps the head of the people. We as a human being can associate meaning to it, but can our machine do the same thing? And this is where another neural network is going to come in, helping us associate meaning to these pixels. Let's say you have a visual concept. I just mentioned head of people. That's a concept that we can understand. Let's say your concepts could be objects, for instance, shelf, plant, airplane, etc. It could be parts, in this case, person top, person bottom, top of a tree, bottom of a tree, etc. You can have some materials like food, hair, skin, paper, etc. And then you can have some colors. These are some concepts that we as human beings are, are going to understand. You're going to train a segmentation model. This is going to be a neural network, or it could be a simple uh, classical segmentation model from computer vision. What is its job? It's going to look at an image. It's going to look at a pixel, for instance, this pixel here, and it's going to answer this question. Is there a person top in this position? Yes or no? Is there a person top in this position? Yes or no? And that's the entire job of this uh, neural network or this model. Why is it useful? Now you are associating meaning to every single pixel. You are segmenting your image. This pixel is of color orange. This pixel is yellow, etc. How can you now use this? You have an index C, which is going to index over your visual concepts. You have an index U, which is going to index over the uh, units in your neural network. And then you can look at a metric. And this metric is very useful. We are going to keep using it over and over again in the future. It's intersection over union. And it's going to tell you the agreement between a particular concept and a particular unit. How? You're going to look at uh, all of the pixels that are above a threshold. In this case, these are the pixels that are above that threshold coming out of your VGG neural network. You're going to look at all of the pixels that have the concept of a C, for instance, all of the pixels that are red, or all of the pixels that correspond to person top, and intersect them. So it's the intersection of two sets. And then you divide it by the union of the same two sets over your images, over your pixels. Now, what, why is it cool? Now you can say, I'm going to look at unit 498. I'm going to visualize it. And then I'm going to look at the intersection over union of these pixels and every single concept that I'm studying, for instance, shelf, plant, airplane, etc. And then you're going to see that this unit is actually going to correspond to an oven unit. The corresponding concept is oven. This, this unit here is going to correspond to person top. And this is how you're actually associating meanings to your units. Unit 10 of convolution 5, the third one, is a unit that's going to look at or it's going to look for person top. And unit 498 is looking for ovens. There is a question in the chat. When you detect these objects, is the boundary of each individual concept continuous and closed or discontinuous? This could end up being discontinuous, for instance, in this case. When you're actually visualizing unit 498, this could end up being discontinuous. And then at the same time, if there are any discontinuities, you're going to try to relax it. But you don't have to. If you want your figures to look better, you can actually uh, relax it and try to make it continuous. Does that answer your question? Uh, so was everything clear up until now? There is a question, how do we know that the distribution of the segmentation activations are similar to the distribution of the unit activation so that we can reuse the same threshold so first of all, the threshold, you are using it only to visualize, to detect. That's it. So the threshold has nothing to do with your interpretability concept. So it has nothing to do with your segmentation model. These are two different things. One of them is going to look at a unit, and it's going to tell that this unit is focusing on this part of the image. The other one is going to pick a concept and say that these pixels in this image 
correspond to this particular concept. And now you are going to intersect these two together or intersect them, divide them by their union, and then that's going to give you a single score. Okay. Yes, so I guess there was a confusion here that this SC of X and P is going to be bigger than the threshold. No, it has nothing to do with the threshold. As soon as you tell it what concept you want, what is your image, the corresponding pixels are going to show up. Okay, perfect. Now let's do another experiment. Let's take a look at the units of Conv53, study all of them, and then try to remove them one after another. And by removing, you are just setting it to zero. You remove it and then see which one is going to have the most impact on the accuracy, which one, which one is going to give you the most accuracy loss. And it turns out that if you remove unit 261 out of Conv53 layer, your training is going to drop this much. Your validation accuracy is going to drop that much. So this is an important unit for you being able to correctly classifying a ski resort. Same thing for unit 190, 149, 242, and 105. So far, so good. This has nothing to do with the meanings. Now you're going to associate a meaning to unit 261 in your neural network by seeking help from this uh, segmentation model. And it turns out that these pixels that you're actually, your unit is looking at, are going to correspond to snow. And that makes sense. If you remove a unit that corresponds to snow from a ski resort, you should expect to lose a lot of accuracy. Same thing for unit 149. It's looking at mountaintop. This other one is looking at houses. This other one is looking at the top of the trees. So now your units have meanings, and those meanings actually make sense. If you remove them, you're going to end up with a lower accuracy. This was for a discriminative model. You can do the same thing for a generative model. It's just the inverse route. There are going to be some units in a generative model. Some of them are going to have meaning. For instance, some of them are going to correspond to trees. If you remove the units that are going to correspond to trees, the trees are actually going to disappear from the generated image. And this is beautiful. I encourage you to watch the corresponding videos for this paper. It's beautiful. The other one, is associating uh, meaning to adversarial examples. Why are adversarial examples adversarial in the first place? And it turns out that, that if you dig deeper into the details and try to visualize and understand, you're gonna see that they actually are attacking the most important units. For instance, an, adversarially, an adversarial example is gonna mess up with the snow and then you're gonna classify this as something else. So it's gonna mess up the units that are gonna correspond to snow. Any questions about this paper? So was everything clear? Okay. Perfect.